Huzzah! I am Jonathan, also known as the Medieval Genie, and today we're going to be talking about British Military Saber. We're going to be talking about the guards and stances that they use in most of their systems, such as Roworth and Angelo's system. So, of course, for this sort of system, it doesn't really work because it's very much often a hands-forward system. I do not recommend trying this with something like an arming sword because this basket hilt or a similar sort of very protective hilt is absolutely essential. If you do this with something that doesn't give you sufficient hand protection, you're going to get your hands, fingers and forearms chopped up like mincemeat. And that is not recommended when your quarry is a bit getting a bit spicy with you. So, hand protection, absolutely vital. But apart from that, this can work with military sabre, it can work with things like broadsword, backsword, and other things that have these sorts of hilts. They can have straight blades, wildly curved blades, or in cases like this, slightly curved blades. So apart from that, it's a fairly universal system. Now, we'll get first things first. In terms of your stance, you'll start with your dominant foot forward. So for the purposes of this exercise, I am of course right-handed. So you will have the right hand holding the sabre, the right foot forward, and the left foot back. And in terms of securing, or getting your hand secure, you do not want to be doing anything like this. For the same purpose as I mentioned earlier, you do not want your hands getting chopped. You may wish to utilise your offhand for certain special actions like disarms, grabbing the opponent, and other such things, but most of the time you want to keep the hand safe and keep it behind you. Whether you stick it behind your back like so, whether you look fancy and put it on your hip, I don't care. As long as you're keeping your hand out of the way, if you're used to sort of epe and rapier, you might be even used to doing this sort of thing, keeping your hand raised aloft behind you, that works perfectly fine too. As long as the hand is ready, but at the same time, not exposed. So, for our first position, we have got this. So this is straight in front of you, forwards, so hilt like so, and this is called the medium guard. Now, quite rightly, a lot of people don't like this, because unlike most other guards and positions I'm going to be showing you, it doesn't really protect anything whatsoever. It is a position, you have the point forward, so you can threaten the opponent if they were, for example, stupid enough to charge at you with a knife and skewer themselves on your blade, good for you. But if your quarry is someone with more than two brain cells between them, not recommended. Because, as you can see, this side's exposed, this side's exposed, you've got the head exposed, the lower, there's nothing protected. So if anyone does any sort of attack at you, it doesn't really do anything. You have to deliberately change it. Uh, the main advantage to keep it fair and, you know, balanced, uh, one of the advantages is that it can quickly go into the inside and outside guards fairly quickly compared to swapping between each other, which we'll see in a moment. So, let's chuck this guard out of the way because, in my opinion, it is absolutely shoddy. Let's keep it safe for the kids. So we shall switch to the outside guard. So, this time I have done just a simple movement, a turn of the hand, so I've got my point towards the opponent, or I can keep it up, that I'll discuss in a minute, but in this we have the basket facing on the outside. So I'm right-handed, so therefore the hilt is facing to my right. Now what this does is without even moving, without doing anything, I am in a ready position, I can perform cuts, I can perform thrusts, I can defend, so I can do other actions, I am free and open to do those things, and yet, without even moving, if you are, and I have experienced this in sparring, if you are against a sufficiently unintelligent opponent, they may well not even realise this is an inherently protected stance. So if the opponent was to attack from their left, or in this case my right, this puts a sword in a way, ready for a hard parry. Now this can be utilised in two ways. This can be a passive sort of stance, so you'll notice as I'm here, I have got my point towards you. So imagining you, the audience, are my opponent, the point is towards your face, and therefore I can easily thrust. If someone's stupid enough to charge, they can skewer themselves on my blade, 
and make my job rather easy, but I can also raise the point more aloft. Now I do this sometimes in sparring because I find out here, like I said, it's good for keeping the point on line. So let's say you have an opponent thrust at you and you avert their thrust and now the point is on line. I only have to step forwards and that could very well skewer them. If I need a bit more reach, I'll extend my arm. So I can do something like take it out and do this. Very minimalistic, very little effort needed and you can get a good solid thrust done with something like an opponent who is particularly strong. So if you're worried that doing this, someone's going to really try to wallop your blade and beat it aside, so then going through your parry, what you can do is basically lift the point and you bring the sword a bit closer to you. And it basically, it's hard to explain because I'm not an expert in biomechanics, but it sort of braces it against the body more. So if someone's trying to hit really hard, I sometimes lift the point and go back, and that means it's sort of coiled up more, take that hit, and it's less likely to go through and hit me or beat my sword aside ready for some other sort of action. So, of course, we've got that in the outside guard, and all of the same advantages apply for this, which is the inside guard. Now notice, with each of these movements, for the passive version, the point is always towards the opponent. I don't keep the blade away, because that gives an opening. Someone can charge in before I can get the blade in there, it also means that the point isn't as much of a threat, so I can't immediately begin to attack them. With these passive versions, I've always got the point facing towards the opponent, and I merely turn the hand inwards, and I've got the inside guard. You'll also notice there's the line here, so here's my body, which can be a target. I'm not having the inside guard or the outside guard around here, because my body is still exposed. It's just here. I don't need to go extreme. I don't need to do anything over the top. Again, it's a very minimalistic, simple system where you don't need too much effort because you're, you might need to fight for a long time. If you're doing things like this, it can be quite strenuous because you're maybe going from here, here, and doing that. Not only are you slow, but it also tires you more. So it's just simple movements like here from the medium guard we don't really use. Turn, a little movement. I've got my outside covered turn here for the inside guard, and the same sort of thing, my point is towards my opponent, but my hilt is now on the inside. Now I most often use this because opponents are often right-handed and they cut from their right. So you can have something like here, tempt them, turn into parry. And like I said before, if, they're ex if you're expecting them to do a very hard hit, raise the point, bring it closer to the body, and you brace it more, ready for a harder, sterner parry on the forte of your blade, which is the strongest part. This part doesn't parry much. This is excellent for parrying. And from there, with both the outside and the inside guard, whether you're out here, you've got a point on more, ready for your thrust. So on the inside guard, ready for the thrust. If you have the point back, again, it hard parries more, but also it sort of braces it because this is a ready position, but it allows you to have more of an arc for swinging. So if I go from here, and let's say I cut towards the head, I can go, or I cut towards, uh, towards the leg, I can go, but it's not as much of a hard hit. So if I go like that, you'll even hear it in a whoosh of the sword. Listen. There's significantly more force to it, and I'm not needing to spend ages pulling back and then swinging because again too much effort too slow we don't want the opponent to know what we're doing we don't really want to spend that much exertion wailing down on probably countless opponents so that's why you can have point up gives you a more powerful cut if you should so wish but with the disadvantage that if you've got the point raised you're no longer threatening them with the point so it's easier for them to charge in and potentially disarm you or use some sort of knife or similar very close contact item. So after that, we have got out here, so we've got the hanging guard. This is very useful for, of course, you can retract back into defending your head. Something like a hanging guard here. I've even, eh, not so much for a British system, we don't tend to see this, but it is possible to go from here and extend out to that sort of hard sloping parry, ready for a more broad action but it is more strenuous than using inside and outside guards. From here, 
It is very easy to perform circular cuts. So I can, for example, do this sort of cut. I can do that sort of cut and that sort of cut. And you'll notice I'm not, oh, I can use my whole arm. I can use from my elbow or in what I showed you before, I can just use my wrist. And depending on whether you're using a full arm from the elbow or from the wrist, you'll find different advantages and disadvantages in how fast you attack, how powerfully you attack, and also what signals you give to the opponent. Whether you want to faint with something more obvious, whether you want to use more power, or whether you wish to be more quick and deceptive. That is up to your personal choice, and I won't tell you what to do. You need to figure it out for yourself. Now, from there, there is also this, which is the... I think it's called the inside hanger, or no, half circle guard, that's it. This is one you do not use very often. It is a bit uncomfortable. So I've just basically done, I was quite a cut three if you're used to numbered cuts. So just cut basically from my dominant side under as if I was going to chop up at someone's cheek. I'm into this position. This is a very specific guard. And it's not really one you hold for a long time. In fact, I'm getting strained even as I say this. It's good for defending the wrist if someone is trying to do just that sort of cut. So let's say we're here. One of the weaknesses is you can do an undercut like that. And it can basically cut into the forearm or the wrist. Or even into the hand if you're lucky. Doing something like this prevents that very action. And traditionally allows you to perform that action in and of itself. So I can go from here and cut under. And I have on many occasions seen people in this hanging guard cut under and just cut their forearms then retract it out of measure before they even realise what hit them. So apart from that, another non-static guard is here. And this is called the Guard of St George. The blade is horizontal and it is raised above your head. Now it is very obvious what this does. It blocks someone trying to split your skull open. So let's say someone's trying to wail on you with a tulwar or sabre. Block here, and you've got a fairly sturdy parry. And this again, it is something that, again, it's an advantage of the basket hilt. Because out here, like I do have some sort of arming sword or similar thing, I'm on the foible on this part of the blade, which is very weak. Someone could cut through, push the blade aside, and begin to split my skull open. I don't want that to happen. So I can, if I should so wish, have the hilt a bit closer and it doesn't matter so much because this basket hilt can still take the hit. So I could be here, someone tries to split my skull open, whack around here, and it may damage the guard and my sword may need repairing later on, but that is okay because I didn't die and I'm presumably more valuable than my sabre. If not, and they're hitting on the blade, it's probably going to hit somewhere around the forte, which is this lower half of the sword where you parry the strongest. Now another thing you can do is from here, it's also a bit like a whirling motion. You can do that as a sort of parry or as some sort of motion, let's say someone cuts your legs, you close your feet together to get it out of the way and then put the sword up here just in case they faint, cut to the head. Or even if you never feel any contact up here, it's a nice primer, just like when we pulled the point back earlier with the inside and outside guards. It allows you to be primed, ready for a harder attack, which can be towards me like the head, or the legs, or wherever you feel. You could potentially also faint and then extend it out into a thrust. You've got, again, a very wide range of choices you can do from these. So next up, we have the half hanger, which is down here and out here. So you've got the inside, and the outside. So if someone were trying to cut you low, and let's say you weren't confident you could close your legs and pull the front leg out of the way by closing your feet together, and you thought maybe you're going to still get cut, or maybe, for example, I'm quite short at only five foot seven, so a lot of opponents can lunge out and they can reach so far that even if I do close my legs together, they will still cut at me successfully because they've just got that much extra reach when they lunge. This is where you can use these sorts of inside and outside half hangers. So that parries the legs, but also if someone were to thrust towards your belly 
and other attacks like that towards the middle, you can parry that way as well. And it's fantastic, again, it, this isn't a static guard, you wouldn't spend your time here because you're exposing your arms, you're presenting a target saying, here, chop this, and same sort of thing out here, you've got all of this exposed. But as something transitional, an action that you're performing, like say, someone cuts at you, or someone thrusts at you, you're doing that quick and simple movement to turn the hand, get the point ready, and it's all done. What you can do from this as well is it is again primed, so I have on a few occasions gone into this rather than going to this sort of hanging guard and then been able to cut. Maybe someone's been cutting towards the middle or lower body, I have then gone into this half hanger and it's very much primed. You only need to turn the hand or you can use up to your full arms if you want and then riposte. So you're then doing this action, carve out and chop the opponent open. Very useful. Of course, not so much from here. If I was going to this outside version, I'd be more tempted. I wouldn't really want to kind of pull away and, and cut or try to do it out like that because they might turn in and try to cut me. It's too slow, but this does feel quite useful for extending a thrust. Again, that's my personal choice. What you prefer to do with your own body is more of your own choice. But I find parrying on the outside half hanger prime through an under thrust. Nice making sure you're getting even underneath some sort of attempted parry they might do higher up, even if you're aiming for somewhere like the face, because you're going from such a low angle that they might not even see it coming. And apart from that, I do believe that is our full list. So yes, apart from that, you have got, I mentioned, hanging out here. It can go into this, it can go into that. So with these, again it's primed, this is transitional. Here, point forwards, this is static. You can stay here, it's strenuous on your arms, and if you're new, I strongly recommend practicing this, because otherwise you will feel a lot of strain in your wrist and your forearms, and you'll get tired and eventually just drop. It won't be very sustainable. When you've got practice, you begin to build up conditioning and tolerance so that you can stay in here as long as I am now, yakking at you, and it allows you to perform those cuts and thrusts. But with this static dart, you've also got here, which is not a static guard. I would not recommend going here because it's more difficult to try and transition elsewhere into something like outside guard, inside guard, and areas like that. This is something you do as a physical and deliberate action, such as you're out here, you're expecting someone to really try to hammer down on you, and then you can go out to this parry riposte, ideally by stepping offline. This starts to, you don't see it quite as much in the British military sabre as far as I can tell, but it's extremely useful as a general action to parry and riposte against particularly hefty blows. Just make sure you're not reacting to anything that's a feint, because with such committed actions, it makes it harder to recover if it turns out they're doing, say, feint in one direction, cut to the other direction. Excuse me, so that's the guards. So, feel free to say in the comments what your favourite guards are, that if you've had time to experiment, and if you've learnt anything today. If you wish to learn more about British military sabre, according to the traditions of people like Roerth and Angelo, Please let me know, and thank you for your time, I shall see you next time. Until then, hurrah!